Good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Strauss. I'm the Rabbi Emeritus at Mainline Reform Temple, just outside of Philadelphia. And it's wonderful to be with all of you, friends old and new, builders of peace, pursuers of peace, seekers of peace and justice in our own communities, in this country, and around the world. Uh, a few bookkeeping items. Uh, first, Rabbi Kronish is going to speak for a little bit. Uh, then we're going to introduce Bishop Yunan and Rabbi Miller, and then there'll be an opportunity for you to be able to ask questions or share comments. If you want to share comments and thoughts, you need to put them in the chat room. And if you want to ask questions, we ask that you put them in the Q&A. You can find all of this, hopefully, uh, by the icon at the bottom of your screen. And one last bookkeeping. I'd ask that if you put a question, it be a question and not a three-paragraph statement. So thank you. So first, it's my honor to be able to introduce my colleague, my friend, my teacher, Rabbi Ron Kronish. Rabbi Kronish is a library fellow at the Van Leer Institute in Jerusalem. From 1991 to 2015, he served as the founder and director of the Interreligious Coordinating Committee in Israel, which grew to become not only the premier, but the largest umbrella interfaith, multi-faith organization in Israel and the Holy Land. Rabbi Kronos was educated at Brandeis University, was ordained from the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, and received his ED at Harvard Graduate School of Education. I'd hold his book up. He'll have to do that because my copy is on a Kindle. But his latest book is Profiles in Peace, which is uh, the topic of our webinar today. And um, Taryn Jeet is going to put in how to be able to order the book, which you'll all want to do after this webinar. Uh, on Amazon or at your local bookstore. So with that, Rabbi Kronish, uh, a two-part question. Why did you write this book? And especially, why now? Okay, well, I didn't write it now. I've been writing it for four years. I only published it now. So uh, <clears throat> if I've written it now, I don't know if I would do it in exactly the same way, but that's uh, we'll get to that. Um, so uh, I uh, have been active in the field of peace building, religious peace building in Israel for the past uh, 30 years. And when I retired uh, eight years ago, uh, I decided to devote uh, my energies to uh, writing and teaching. And uh, this is my third book in eight years. Uh, one was a group collection of essays. Another one was a memoir where I sat down and wrote everything I learned in the field. Uh, over all these years. And this book I started to write a few years ago. I wanted to profile the lives of six peace builders, actually 10 in the book, uh, Israeli and Palestinian uh, individuals who have been working in the uh, area of peace building between Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs uh, for a long time. And the main reason I wanted to do that is their work is largely unknown uh, outside of Israel and even inside of Israel, uh, because most of the focus of uh, the media, the mainstream media for sure, and even social media is on the so-called political peace process, meaning the peace process that deals with getting agreements between governments uh, the, in our case, uh, the Palestinian government and the Israeli government. Um, some of you who have been following our conflict may remember that we used to have such agreements. Back in the good old 1990s, we had several agreements uh, between Israelis and the Palestinians. They were called the Oslo Accords. Maybe you've seen the movie by now uh, or read the book or seen the play. Uh, but we had a, a series of agreements with the, with the Palestinians. Uh, uh, we had an agreement with the Vatican the, that decade, one with Jordan. We had an old peace agreement with Egypt. We have had uh, political peace agreements, but we haven't had one in a long time. In fact, the last one was signed in 1998. And so since then, all well, we've had talk about how to get people to the table to have talk about how to maybe think about having another political agreement between governments. 
In the meantime, during these last 24 years, the peace builders, who I defined as uh, the people on the ground, rabbis, imams, qadis, psychologists, social workers, educators, youth workers, and many others, people on the ground as individuals and in many organizations and on the web uh, are doing very interesting and important work in bringing people to learn to live together in peace with one another, which is a different agenda than the political peace agreements. Uh, uh, it's related, but uh, it, it says that politics is not the whole story and our role as, uh, as, as peace builders people who be, build peace between people is to engage them in dialogue and education in a variety of ways so that they understand each other deeply and build trust between each other. Uh, and I wanted people to know more about this. So I wrote a book about six, uh, actually 10, because of uh, Rabbi Elkanan is part of the younger generation at the, the end of the book. I wanted uh, some younger people to be in the story in order to uh, get this uh, concept out there of peace builders and to say to the world that we here have not forgotten the topic of peace, even if our governments may have forgotten it for the time being, uh, many of us here are still have it on our mind. So you, you've made a distinction between peacemakers and peace builders. Can you speak a little bit more about that distinction and um, why you think both are so necessary? Well, uh, I call the peacemakers, uh, not the term used in the uh, New Testament, but the conflict resolution team peacemakers. Uh, I call them the politicians, the international relations experts. If I like to do shorthand, I say they're the lawyers and we're the rabbis. Okay, so the lawyers uh, use a method called negotiation. They, you know, get people in the room and by the end of the day or the end of the week, we want everybody to compromise and we'll have an, we'll hammer out an agreement. But we kind of did a lot of homework beforehand before we came into the room to know that the agreement was possible. That's the world of business and the world of politics uh, relying on negotiations. The world of, of peace, as I see it, of what I call the peace builders. And by the way, I've adapted this term from people who've written in the field of conflict resolution like Paul, John Paul Lederach and others. And I've made a shorter version of it, I think a more understandable version. The peace builders are all of us who want people to learn to live in peace together. And we want the grassroots to do it. And we want more and more people in the grassroots to do it. And we think that more, the more and more people will do it, it will affect uh, uh, also at some point in time, uh, the policy makers. At the end of the day, I argue the two come together. We need both. Uh, unfortunately, in my reading of the situation, we only have one right now here. And so uh, I think the world needs to know that peace building is alive and well in Israel and even in Palestine. And a lot of it goes on and you don't know much about it. And this is one opportunity you to learn something about it. And another opportunity is to buy my book and read it and to read about many other people who are engaged in peace building uh, work in Israel and in Palestine, often jointly together, Israelis and Palestinians. And these folks, I argue, and we'll hear what our panelists say, uh, they are the folks who are today, in my view, are keeping a flicker of hope alive in a pretty dark uh, situation at the moment. So one last question before we invite your colleagues to join our conversation. Um, why was it so important to tell these stories now? You hinted well, at like I said, I've, I've been working at them for a few years, uh, but I, I, I'm happy that the book is published now uh, uh, because um, uh, I, you know, I'll tell you a quick story and, and the listeners, I when the uh, the person who was uh, the, the organization that's distributing my book, it's called Ingram Spark. It's a self-published book. I had to list categories of what the book is in. So I wrote peace and I checked off the 
conflict resolution. And then I checked off inspirational uh, because I felt, and I think people who read the book have told me that when you read a lot of the stories of the people who are, have done this work for so long, and especially uh, the ones uh, who are still doing it now, decades later, and they know the difficulties and the challenges, uh, many of these people fit my definition of what I call a PP, a persistent peace builder. That means don't give up, don't give in to despair, even though uh, this year's government looks pretty bad, not everything is collapsing. I know many of my friends in America lived through four years of a uh, government a couple of years ago, and many of them would tell me the sky is falling in and looks pretty bad, but you know, you survived it and, 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 and hope has been rekindled. So uh, uh, the political swings will come and go, but we uh, rabbis and educators, if I speak for myself, are here for the long haul. We don't do this for four years, to get elected for four years or two years. <coughs> We're here for 20 years or 30 years. So I, I would have done it now. And I, in fact, I'm starting next week to write a new series of blogs uh, a blog post on P on other peace builders, uh, because uh, I think it's important that uh, that uh, people know that uh, they exist and that we're not alone uh, in this, and and that uh, many of their organizations and and uh, uh, that work uh, in the field and on and on the internet uh, are doing groundbreaking work that needs more support. Uh, 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 moral support and financial support. So I would do it now, and I am going to do it now uh, in the weeks ahead. Wonderful. So I want to uh, invite your and our two colleagues to be able to join this conversation. Let me first introduce them. Rabbi Elchanan Miller uh, is featured in the back of your book, one of our younger colleagues engaging in peace building, and really a fascinating story of what he is doing. He is the founder of The People of the Book, an initiative that harnesses the, social, the reach of social media to educate a younger generation of Arabs curious about Jewish faith and culture. A language specialist, he completed his BA and MA degrees in Middle East history and Islamic studies at the Hebrew University and served for a while as the Arab affairs reporter for the Times of Israel. He's a Jerusalem native and regularly comments on Israeli politics and international Arabic news channels, including Al Jazeera, BBC Arabic, Sky News, Arabia, and Israel's public broadcaster, Khan. His opinion articles have appeared in the New York Times and in the Wall Street Journal, and he is a Hevruta faculty member currently at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Bishop uh, Yunan has been at this uh, for nearly his entire life. Bishop Yunan is the Bishop Emeritus of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Jordan and the Holy Land, and an honorary president for Religions for Peace. Bishop Yunan was the former president from 2010 to 2017 of the Lutheran World Federation, a global communion of Christian churches with 145 member churches in 79 countries, representing more than 70 million Christians. His term as acting bishop was from December of 1998 until January of 2018. Bishop Yunan was educated both in Palestine and Finland and has been active in numerous faith organizations, such as the Middle East Council of Churches, the Lutheran World Federation, and the Fellowship of Middle East Evangelical Churches. The bishop is an active member of various ecumenical and interfaith dialogue initiatives in Jerusalem that he helped found, many of them along with Rabbi Kronish. So if you could share, maybe Bishop first, what motivates you to be a peacemaker? And how is that connected to your religious faith? Thank you very much for, uh, for this webinar. And uh, I would like to also to thank, you know, uh, Rabbi Ron Cronish for writing this book and even asking me to be one of them. And of course, I accept it. Now, what really uh, motivates me to work for peace based on justice? First of all, you know, it's my faith, which uh, either in the Old Testament, which is the Hebrew Bible, or in the New Testament, <laughs> uh, we are called to be uh, 
peace builders and if you look or peacemakers even not peace talkers because we have many peace talkers but we have very few peacemakers in our world or who builds peace and works for them because peace is not any peace it's peace based on justice and if you read the your hebrew bible the old testament you find that the core of this bible is justice and you have to understand it from that point of view the same thing when we look you know for the new testament what jesus christ has asked us to uh, to be to work for peace but also saint paul writes that we have been given you know the ministry of reconciliation so if we are serious for our faith and for our biblical text we have really work for peace to work for justice not for our sake not for our reputation but for the sake of humanity and for the people we are living in and that is the reason you see i was always motivated to work you know for peace based on justice and if you like reconciliation based on forgiveness that's very important for us you know as religious leaders and people in this country the second reason is as you have seen you know i have been living most of life under israeli occupation you know i've never lived you know in peace in real peace and uh, i don't want this to continue it's not good for palestinians it's not good for the israelis because occupation is de depriving the other their own human rights and their own dignity and everybody should live in their dignity which god has given us you see when he created us he created us on his image so he wants us to live this dignity in peace and justice and practice our human rights in in this life so for me you know the politics which we are facing today in this country is very dangerous it's very dangerous for the israelis it's very dangerous for us palestinians we will see we are really going nowhere we are as if living you know in a desert without any compass and that's dangerous and that's what we are facing today i mean when i hear either the arabic news or the hebrew news or english news in this country i get depressed because all of them are fighting for their own interests but they are not fighting for justice and that is what really we have really to work you know we are not politicians i have no interest to become a prime minister or a president or a minister or a politician my interest is that people in this country palestinians and israelis will live the dignity god gave them and that means peace based on justice and that's what we have to work today even with this israeli government we have to be more proactive and not to be shy to raise our voices even if we will have problems with them sorry brother just as we go forward i don't want to be the only one on the screen to be able to ask questions so i would invite the three of you to also ask questions of each other or comment on each other's comments or or challenge them so if i can rabbi miller i want to ask you the same question with a second part to it which is what motivates you uh, to be a peace builder and when you hear the bishop use words like occupation and peace with justice how does that resonate with you uh thanks first of all rabbi strauss for this kind introduction and thanks ron uh, rabbi kronish for uh inviting me to speak here and for your uh, great book and for including me in the book in the sort of chapter on young peace builders. I'm very honored to be part of that. Um, I think I'd like to echo what Bishop Yunan said, which is that for us, this conflict and trying to solve it is existential. It's not a pastime, it's not a hobby. It's our lives. It's the lives of our families. It's the, our society. Um, so it's really, really in our hearts, and it's something very, very existential for us to solve. And I think that's where it started. Um, my journey toward in the peace building uh, track, I guess, started when I was 13. 
uh, when in my religious boys, not, not boys, but my religious boys high school and middle school, I was taught Arabic by Jewish teachers, actually. My, my entire education in Islamic studies from grade seven up until my master's degree was all done by, by Jews, which is both sad, but also interesting in the sense that um, that's where I was exposed to uh, the need, I guess, to solve the conflict. Um, and, and the gateway into that was language. So for me, language and learning Arabic was always a very, very integral and, and, and inherent part of, 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 of peacemaking. And I think once you learn the language of the other, it almost becomes inevitable for you, um, in my own experience, to uh, be able to communicate with someone else. And um, so for me, language is really key. Um, through the language that I had acquired, I started uh, meeting with Palestinians face to face uh, in my undergraduate degree in college. And that's where I met Rabbi Kronish as a participant, as a young undergraduate student in one of the dialogue programs that Rabbi Kronish's organization at the time, ICCI, ran. <clears throat> so both as a participant and as a translator, I became exposed to Palestinian narratives. And once you see the Palestinians, not just as the other or as the enemy, as many Israelis um, are brought up, you know, in this conflictual situation, then uh, peacemaking becomes a personal issue for you, not just an intellectual issue. And you can't ignore the stories and the narratives of your neighbors. And always the participants in these programs were my neighbors in Jerusalem, whether students studying here or people who are native to this city, like I am. Um, and this long journey through um, a stint in journalism led me in 2016 to start training as a rabbi in the modern Orthodox tradition. Um, and it, I was sort of at a crossroads at some point. I was debating whether to take an academic track or to take a rabbinic track. And at some point, past my master's degree, I said, well, there's so many academics out there studying Middle East intellectually. There are very few rabbis who specialize in the Middle East or in Islamic studies or in peacemaking. And I thought it was about time for um, religious people, people of faith to put their energies and to dedicate their time and, and, and make their vocations about peace building. So while I was studying to be a rabbi in the seminary that I was studying in, in Jerusalem, I started creating this project called People of the Book, Ahl al-Kitab, which is the term used by Islam to uh, refer to Jews and Muslims and Christians. Um, and um, this program, this initiative evolved over the past five years since I began creating it. And uh, thank you for sharing the website on the screen. Um, it evolved into a very large project that lives on social media, primarily on um, YouTube and Facebook, and mostly is directed to Muslim Arabs, but not exclusively, um, and tries to explain Jewish faith and culture to Arabs. Um, it's not limited to the Palestinian context. It's um, on social media, so it's very much um, directed at anyone who speaks Arabic. Of course, it's accessible in English as well with subtitles and in the original, um, original videos in English. Um, and as you can see, these are the videos um, that I've, I've created over the years. Some of them are cartoons that um, explain faith and practice. And some of them are interviews with um, Jews who emigrated to Israel from the Arab Middle East and can talk uh, about their experiences living in the Arab world. So all of this is sort of a, I'd say an experiment in peace building that hasn't been done yet. And uh, Rabbi Kroner spoke about the peace builders and the peacemakers, uh, you know, these two separate tracks, the diplomatic track and the grassroots track. And I think it's really great that the book highlights this other track that has, has been neglected, I think, in a lot of the writing about peacemaking, which is the fact that there are people on the ground whether the peace process falters or, or succeeds, who are always dedicated to this from a, an array of perspectives. And the book actually highlights the religious peace builders, uh, which is a phenomenon that existed for many years, but uh, I think is getting more attention now. Um, wh whatever you think about, for example, the Abraham Accords, whether you're positive or negative about them, the language of religion and of faith and of culture has been much more pronounced 
in the more recent peacemaking activities than, for example, in the 70s or 80s or 90s with Egypt and Jordan and, and, and the Palestinians in the Oslo Accords. Um, and one depends on the other. Um, you can't, the diplomats unfortunately failed in achieving peace just through diplomatic means. Um, and of course that, you know, civil society and grassroots can't do it on their own, but they can create the infrastructure and the acceptance uh, among the broader segments of society and especially those who are resistant uh, to peace and might be hostile to some of these diplomatic um, endeavors. This prepares the ground uh, for that peacemaking uh, initiative. And a lot of the people I've interviewed and a lot of the people I, I live with and work with are very skeptical about peace. Um, peace has become a cliche a little bit here. Uh, people have become jaded and um, we need a new language. We need new fresh ways to talk about peace and to engage people. And that's why I use cartoons to make peace. That's why I use interviews to make peace. We have to think out of the box, I think, and um, slowly but surely to create the, the grassroots support for the people to later then vote in parties and, and governments that will support peace. But without this grassroots, um, I think it'll be very hard to actually finalize peace accords and peace agreements. They don't hear you. Emma? Just a quick follow-up, if I may. Um, you said that what you're doing is unique, and in some sense it is unique, but it also strikes me in many ways you are recreating what at least some of us think was the experience in Andalusia of Jews and Muslims living in relationship with one another. Granted, it was a, a pre-modern experience. It's an open question about whether it was 200 years or 700 years, and whether it was an elite experience or really permeated down to, to people in the street. But first question is, I'm wondering if... Um, is your project also an opportunity for Jew, Jewish Israelis to learn about Islam? Yes, absolutely. Let me let me answer your first remark about Andalusia. And yes, that is a, you know, um, I think a salient remark. I just think that the difference is that in Andalusia, Jews and Muslims actually lived together and interacted personally. Today, um, you know, the political developments of the 20th century, the tragic developments, the Nakba and, you know, the creation of Israel and other historic facts have driven Jews and Muslims apart or Jews and Arabs more broadly, not just Muslims, Jews and Arabs apart. And today, Jews and Arabs hardly interact um, as neighbors or on a normal basis. So social media becomes such a tool that can spread not just hatred, but also spread knowledge. And in that sense, maybe the Andalusian model is good because it was such a place of creativity and knowledge. Um, about the second question regarding whether this is also directed at Jews. So the primary audience of my project isn't uh, the Jews. It's primarily one directional at the moment, or mostly from um, you know, a Jewish rabbi to the broader Muslim and Arab world. However, um, I share a lot of these videos on my personal um, channels on Facebook and YouTube, and I translate them to Hebrew as much as I can. And I very much appreciate the feedback I get from Israelis as well. So this is an unintended consequence, I guess, of this project. But more and more, I, I try to model um, sort of an image of, pos of, of positive interaction between Jews and Arabs, which then my fellows, my society can look at as an example of how sort of civil discourse and how respect, mutual respect can look like. Um, right now, for example, I've been interviewing a lot of um, Jews from Arabic lands. And just the fact that I go into people's homes in, across Israel, and some of these people are very right wing and very conservative, and allow them to speak in their native Arabic, and then post that on Facebook. And I get all these comments about, wow, you know, this reminds me of the language of my grandmother. This is how my grandmother spoke. Um, these interviews have brought tears to my eyes. People have been writing to me just in recent days. Um, it's given um, many Jews, I think, the sense of pride in their Middle Eastern origins that have been sort of suppressed and kind of hidden for so many years in Israel because Arabic and Arabs were always considered the language of the enemy. So this allows them sort of to come out of the closet in a sense as proud Jews who are part of this region. Um, 
And I think could except you, uh, could you imagine expanding that uh, as you go forward with a, a kind of Jewish Muslim dialogue through this project? Right. So some of that already exists. I've already partnered with a Muslim partner, um, Celia Jawabra. Yeah. yeah. I'm looking for new partners and I'm looking, of course, to expand this to the Christian world as well, which I've almost entirely neglected to my great embarrassment because they're a very important, um, vital part of this, uh, you know, of the, of the religious and cultural tapestry of this land. Um, so that's 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 the continuation, I hope, of this project is to include more Christian voices and also to make it more, you know, bi-directional, I'd say. And, yeah, and, and well, I was going to ask you to share your story, but being cognizant of time, I, I want to push. Bishop Yunan wants to say something, please. Yeah. But I would like to say two comments, you know, um, uh, first of all, you know, sometimes from the discussions, I'm afraid that people are seeing that the conflict is between Jews and Muslims and not a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians on the land. And that's very dangerous when we put it into a religious you know, context. My second point is, you know, I really appreciate that uh, you would like to know more about Islam and that's very important in this part of the world. But I would like also to mention that in Israel, and among many you know, Israelis, there is big ignorance about us Christians and uh, you know, or about the atrocities that are done by uh, settler movements you know, against Christian churches or cemeteries or, you know, or the, it's unknown who are the Christians. You know, many times when I'm driving my car and I see, they see me a soldier on the check post, he tells me, are you a Catholic? Are you the Pope? Oops. So they don't understand, you know, Rosa. the diversity of Christianity. And I think the Jewish people have, the, I know your the history of Jews in Europe is not, is a very bad one, you see. But at the same time, you have to know that we Christians, Muslims and Jews in this country, in, prior to 1948, we, we lived together and we knew about each other you see, and we respected each other. I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you cannot only know about Islam, but also you have to know about the diversity and the different faces also of Christianity in this part of the, because we are an integral part of this country and peace won't come to this country without involving the Christians. May I make one brief comment about that? I, uh, I would say that uh, in the work that I did over the years, I, when I was asked about this, I would say our work was with two peoples and three religions. The two peoples are the Palestinian people and the Jewish people trying to figure out how to share this land. And the three religions are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, whereby Judaism is by the Jews and the Palestinians are Muslim and Christian. And so that I just wanted to mention that. So if I can just return for a, a brief second to the model of Al-Andalusia, I, I know that a great deal of peace work has been done on trying to create dual narratives. And Rabbi Kronos, you write about the dual narrative mm. in, in many of the chapters of your book. But mm -hmm. Maria Rosa Menacal, who wrote a book called The Ornament of the World, I think suggests a slightly different model. And I'm wondering how you would react to it. This is, this is her quote. This was a chapter referring to Al-Andalusia. This was a chapter of Europe's culture where Jews, Christians, and Muslims, to speak to the bishop's point, live side by side and despite their intractable differences and sometimes enduring hostilities, nourished a complex culture of tolerance. It found expression in the often unconscious acceptance that contradictions within oneself as well as within one's culture, contradictions can be both positive and productive. I'm wondering if that offers a different model. It, it it might offer a, a different model in my view, but I, I think uh, I tend to agree with the Bishop Yunan that our, the, the essence of our conflict right now is the um, is Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You may know that prior to Oslo, before the 90s, our conflict used to be called the Arab-Israeli conflict because mm -hmm. we were fighting all these wars with Arab countries. Now we've made peace with some of those countries and uh, the wars and violence are primarily between Palestinians and the state of Israel. So 
I, I think for me, I would say the dual narrative, uh, learning the Palestinian narrative in all its uh, complexity, which includes the religious narratives that are part of it. So if you're a Palestinian Christian, your Christianity is a central part of your narrative. If you're a Palestinian Muslim, it's a central part of your narrative, how you relate to religion, as well as learning about Jewish diversity. So it gets more complex uh, than the than the duality. Uh, but I, 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 I'm not a fan of the Andalusia model for us today in the 21st century. Anybody else want to react to that, Elhan? Well, I, I would like really to, to give one of the things which were very important to understand. Uh, what Tron and myself have started, what we call, you know, Jonah Group um, in, uh, in 1991, you see. Because prior to that, when we used to dialogue, we used to go to Sweden or to Europe, you know, and uh, then Ron and myself said, uh, you know, our agenda here in this country, Israeli Jews and Palestinian Christians, if I take it that for, is different than the Western, you know, agenda for Jewish Christian dialogue. And we must really discuss issues about land, about justice, about how can we live together, um, about what are the, 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 the what was very important that of course we were Lutherans, Anglicans, Orthodox, Catholics from all you know, and the same thing with from the Jewish part they were you know from the Reform, from conservatives, and from the Orthodox, uh, you know, um, and the first thing what we have learned is that we ignore each other. How can we live together in this country if we ignore the other religion? So we started, I mean, we did not work, we did not launch, you know, an academic discussion. We I wanted to understand the other. So one, one of the important things was, is to visit each other, either in our churches or in our synagogues, and to learn about our feasts. For example, many times with our Jewish partners with whom we dialogue, we had Seder evenings. Many times they came on Christmas or Easter to our services, the Jewish rabbis, you see, with their, with their, with their kippahs. So this have taught both of us, you know, to understand the complexity of the situation, but also to understand the strength in those religions. Now, what this developed, it developed among us trust and friendship that we can, and any dialogue in this country, which, or any work that we have to, if it's not built on trust and friendship and in knowing, knowing the different faces of the other religion, the difference of the other nation, it won't work. You see, it won't work when you are just really, uh, you are just trying, you know, to defame the other, or just if you hear the media, you will feel immediately that, you know, the media is in this country against the human being. Always, you know, it's, it's with, it's one-sided, it's against the other, either on any kind of media. This is very harmful what we are living today. And I'm really ringing the bell and alerting our world. What, where we are going, we are going to, you know, a peril, to demise if we continue this way. It's our role as religious leaders to make, you know, a U-turn, a chuva, a, a repentance, and work different in this country. We have to give everyone their own rights. I think occupation has to end. Palestinians have to get their justice. You know, we have to live together, you know, both in our own states on 1967 borders with Jerusalem being shared. That's the only way we can really try to, I mean, not to go for peace, not to be, you know, to, stubborn. I don't want peace. I don't want, I don't want to give Palestinians anything. I don't want to give Israelis. It won't work. You know, you know it works only when we are serious for peace and justice. In the, we give everyone their own rights. That's the only way forward, which I believe in. So if I can ask each of you, what makes you optimistic? If you could share briefly a success story that you know brings a smile to your face. Um, all right, I'll start. Um, 
I, I think, um, you know, in my work, which is virtual again, and, and here's maybe a difference with the kind of work that um, Bishop Yunnan has been speaking about, about the personal relationships. Of course, I also created personal relationships, but today it's mostly focused online. Um, to get messages from people in countries that are still considered war countries with Israel, from a Shiite student, for a Lebanese Shiite student who studies in Iraq, that's somebody who I could never, ever have communicated with uh, just 10 years ago. And the fact that social media is today open in all these countries creates an, incre uh, an incredible democratization of, of, of knowledge and of information and of, and of communication, something that has been, um, I think, we've been deprived of uh, as societies uh, before this. Um, so there are many such sort of moving stories. It's hard to, it's hard to share one. Um, I, I think though, I wanna say that, that I think the peace building landscape has changed a lot in the last uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, the people have, who have been creating peace are now people who are coming from very surprising places in Israeli society. Ideological places that I don't necessarily share, but one of the most innovative um, movements today of peacemaking is actually happening in the settler movement and among settlers. Um, and, and actually Rabbi Kronish deals with this a little bit in the book with Hadassah Froman, who is the, the widow of one of the most significant peacemakers that emerged in Israel, Palestine in the last 20 or 30 years. And she's very much, Hadassah has very much filled the, the large shoes of her late husband, Rabbi Froman, who met with Hamas leaders and crossed barriers that no uh, Israeli religious leader or, or leader at all has crossed before. Um, I think that kind of leadership gives us, the younger generation, a boldness that, um, that maybe some official leaders, right, people within the institutions, within the governments, within the, the ministries, don't have because they're confined by government policies. So we can be much more bold and I came to this vocation, you know, as a journalist. And as a journalist, I also went and met Hamas uh, members and spoke to them and interviewed them. So being part of civil society actually gives us freedom that the official diplomats don't have. But we need to be um, bold, I think, in the kinds of meetings we have. Um, and we need to use, as I said before, we need to use language that the other side can hear. And you can only do that when you really know what kind of sensitivities and sensibilities the other side has and be attuned to them. I think that the political language isn't good enough today just to say, to talk about justice and to talk about uh, the pain and the need for um, the political resolution is the goal that I also aspire to. But we need to start way, way before that because the societies aren't, uh, aren't there yet. Before you can talk about actual practical solutions, which we all hope to achieve, we need to acknowledge each other's existence and each other's identities. We need to start in a way that's not even political. Um, and that's why, that's why my project consciously avoids the hard political question, not because I don't have an opinion. I talk about those things all the time on Arabic TV channels when I'm invited you know, to Al Jazeera and stuff. But my project, People of the Book, avoids all those issues and even kind of downplays my Israeli identity, which I'm also proud of. But it starts much earlier. It starts about what are Jews and what's Judaism? What is Islam? How do we share certain traditions? What are, what's our belief system? That humanizes each other um, in a way that no political discourse I think can do because it shows our joint basic aspirations. And, and people in this region are traditional and religious. Um, and that's the language that resonates with them. So, I guess that work is what what you know excites me. When I, I want to give a boost to uh, Rabbi uh, Miller's social media and tell a quick story. You asked for stories. Uh, when I was working, that goes back before 2014. The last conf international conference I attended was Religions for Peace uh, International Meeting in in Vienna. I think it's 2013. If uh, Bishop Yunan, you were there, yes. I believe, uh, uh, and at the conference, uh, there was a workshop one day um, on social media and how the peace-oriented community could use it. And as a, an older person who was not fluent in social media, I went to hear, to listen, to learn. 
Uh, and there was a young uh, man from Google who was head of Google for the Arab world, who was the speaker, one of the speakers. And someone asked him a question about uh, the use of uh, social media in the peace community. And he said, he said something like, you peaceniks are far behind. The other sides figured this out. And I won't go into all the details. I always said, you know, they chop off heads and they make uh, a lot of impression in the world in social media. I don't suggest you chop off heads, but you ought to get some strategy together and start figuring out, out how to use new media and not just face-to-face -face meetings. We're in the 21st century. And I always remember that. Uh, and the second story I'll tell real quick uh, is, um, well, this is more than 10 years ago already, probably 15. Um, I decided that I was, the, the mainstream media never took any interest in my work. Never got a story, nothing. I ran the greatest programs that didn't interest anybody and then one time I'm in New York and there's a young rabbinical student. He's now a rabbi named Joshua Stanton. He was in rabbinical school. He had interned for me. And I said, Joshua, I, I'm not reaching anybody. He says, have you ever heard of the Huffington Post? I said, no, what's that? He said, well, it's this, you know, new online thing uh, set up by this woman area. And they have uh, set up a thing where you can write blog posts for them. And I know the religion editor of the Huffington Post. I don't remember his name at the time. And we walked over. It was a four blocks from the rabbinical school on West 4th Street in New York. And he introduced me to the uh, religion editor of the Huffington Post. And I said, look, I'm telling you the truth. I can't get any coverage for the work we do. I, I just, nobody's interested. He says, I want your story now. You start tomorrow morning. And the next day I wrote my first blog post. So I've been writing blog posts for like 15 years now. And they reach thousands of people who wouldn't see them uh, in the mainstream media. So uh, these are two stories that I think uh, I, uh, we need a uh, uh, new thinking. We need Jewish Muslim track. We need Jewish Christian track. We need Jewish Christian track. And of course, religions for peace, multi-religious track. We need all of these things. Mm. So I want to turn to a couple of the questions that are in our Q&A. Uh, one for you, Bishop Yunan. What would you point us to read that best explains life and the peace prospects from a Palestinian perspective? Oh, <laughs> you know, there are, I mean, <laughs> well, I have written also, of course, uh, I, I, I've written, a, you know, a Witnessing for Peace, which is, of course, with Augsburg. This is a book, you know, uh, where, of course, it explains how uh, we are living together and what are the future of, um, you two know. Two books of, you have. Don't you have two books? Two books, yes. Another one is uh, Our Shared, you know, Witness. Aren't they both with Fortress Press? No, one is with Fortress, one with Erdman, I think. Yes, oh. so they are diff two different. But, you know, um, I would like really to, uh, to, say, uh, to say it's very important, you know, uh, to come and see in this country, and then when you leave, to act also of what's well. And I think when you come to this country, it's important to meet both sides and to hear both narratives. And you may get confused, but it's holy confusion because you are from a holy land. <laughs> see? And, and that's very important, uh, which I always say. I mean, don't try to find solutions from us from the United States or from Europe or from uh, Asia or Africa. I mean, when you come to live with us here, and that's the reason, you know, when you say, what are the hopes? First of all, I agree with, uh, uh, with Rabbi Miller when he says, we need, to we need to revive again what Oslo did, the declaration of principles, the government, has really ignored it, where we recognize both nations. That's the first point to go forward today. Declarations of principle. We accept each other, you see, as nations. And this, the second point is, you know, my hope is that God works in history. You know, uh, if I would have come to tell you in 1988 that Berlin Wall would fall, you would have laughed at me and said, that's a freak. You see. And that's the same thing in my country. 
in this country, the Holy Land. I tell you, God is also working. He will never allow injustice to continue. He will interfere in his own way, in his own, even if we now we see it's a bleak, we don't see any hope. My hope Can he is, hurry up? Can you work quicker? Well, I believe, well, I cannot interfere in, in God's, in God's, you know, I hope he will work. We need more to pray together for justice in this country. I believe in a God of justice. That is my hope. And that's the reason I work for justice. So let me uh, offer two other questions and you can choose to address either or both. Uh, exactly. Bishop, you just said one of the important things we can do to support all of your work is to come to Israel and Palestine and meet with peace builders. How else can we support your work from here in the United States? And the second question, and there are a number of those in, in uh, the Q&A, uh, the Abraham Accords, good, bad, indifferent. Well, well, I'd like to begin and say quickly that you can support. For, I used to, when I was working for a living, I'd say, take out your checkbook and write a check, you know, which you can do. You don't have to, you can use PayPal now. You don't have to write a check. But you can support many of the peace building organizations, the ones of your choice that are doing great work. And there are lots of them. And you, and if you want to know where to find them, I can help you. Okay, you can look, for example, on the Alliance for Middle East Peace website and find 160 organizations and then learn about them. Uh, but the other thing you can do, and I'm, I, I'm only joking when I say to buy the book, although it's okay if you buy the book, uh, is to spread the word of the stories of the people you met tonight and the people you read about in this book and 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 and, uh, and learn more about this side of life that there there are uh, Bishop Yonah mentions come visit uh, Elkanan may remember some of this but when we brought groups to Israel through our my organization we took them every day to see other NGOs working for peace in the Galilee. Uh, and justice in, in Tel Aviv, and you name it, and they spent seven to ten days there. Believe me, they went home with a different feeling than if they had spent seven days in the parliament. Okay, so there are lots of people in Israel and Palestine working together and separately, and the world needs to know more about them, and you can help do that through your many organizations. Religions for Peace uh, is a good format for doing it uh, through, throughout the world, spread the world about the things we write, the uh, Bishop Yunan's two wonderful books, which I read and used in my book, and, and Elkanan Miller's uh, 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 websites, and many others are, are deserving of being known in, in, in adult education and in many formats. Uh, so I, I, you know, in addition to coming and visit and, and learning both sides. Well, let, let, me, let me give two, two, two questions. Or, or, you know. I think the Jewish community in the United States has to hear us Palestinians and Palestinian Christians. And you know, it's very important to hear our point of view, which is ignored, you see. Even you know, when po your politicians come here, we are not of an interest at all in this part of the world, you see. And it's very important to understand and to understand our yearning for peace based on justice, you know, in this in 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 in, in this country. I mean, that's for me, very important. But this is the reason, I mean, Jewish voices for peace that is growing in the United States. I greet them. They are doing good work. They are seeing, you see, because, you know, they are, this comes also to the second question of Abraham Accords. Abraham Accords is, is built on interest, not on justice. It's built on interest and economic interests and security money. interests, money. not on justice, and money. You know, mm -hmm. if you don't solve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, you know, the Arab, you know, and Muslim world, I mean, I don't speak on governments. They won't feel comfortable. Please solve it, you know, and I agree, you know, with the, with the Arab initiative of 2002, solve it. And you will find a different world, you see, because when it's built on justice, you give justice for every for, for everyone. And that's the reason, you know, we 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 have to speak this language. Although some people may think, oh, it's politics. Yes, it's it's in a way politics, but we are the ones who are suffering in this country. You know, you know, I wanted to give you an example just to understand the complexity. You know, 
and please understand, I'm not trying to criticize anybody. But you know, I have a friend in the Haitian camp in Bethlehem. He is working with, he working with us for already 30 years in one of our institutions. He has a child nine years old, you know. The other day he called me and was crying. I said, why? He said, the Israelis stormed Heshi camp. And my son, nine years old, wanted to throw stone. And I forbade him. And I'm afraid he will be killed. You know, tell me, Bishop, what can I do to save my son? I don't want my son to throw stone. I don't want to be killed. You know, this is the real politique which we are living every day. So help us to bring justice. The American Jewish community is responsible to bring justice here and not to be one-sided. Um, maybe, maybe I'll take uh, the second question you asked as well about um, uh, the Abraham Accords. But, but first, uh, just one comment about the United States because you asked about that. Um, the US government just put forward recently a huge uh, bid of $250 million to peace organizations in the Middle East called MEPA through USAID. Uh, it was kind of frozen under the Trump administration. Now it's been thawed and there's a huge, huge amount of money that's dedicated to peace groups. Unfortunately, the bureaucracy of the way you can apply to these grants doesn't really support small organizations. You basically need a full-time grant writer to work for you for years before you can apply to have the money that you need to employ that grant writer. So it's a little bit of a catch-22. Um, I don't know if there's anyone out there listening who can solve this and speak to the American government about making this these funds accessible to small organizations like ours and mine. But um, it's really vital that the, this huge you know, funding, American taxpayer money, go to the actual people on the ground and not just to, to the bigger, more well-established organizations. Now I wanna uh, address um, the question about the Abraham Accords. And I think there's, it's tricky. The Abraham Accords on the one hand have drawn a, a very big blow to the Palestinian cause in one, in one way because they've removed this um, one last, I'd say, pressure uh, tool that the Palestinians had over Israel through the Arab Peace Initiative, which was, you know, if you normalize with the Palestinians, now you'll have normalization with the whole Arab world. And this series of agreements with Morocco and the Emirates and Bahrain have sort of taken the rug out of the, uh, or the, the, the steam out of the engine of, of, of normalization with the Palestinians. On the other hand, it's, it's more complex than that, I think. In order for Israelis to feel at, at any point in the future safe to be able to support a peace government and a peace policy, they have to feel comfortable in the Middle East. They have to feel like they can be accepted as a Jews in, you know, in their independent country in the Middle East. And having traveled to Dubai and to the Emirates a few times, <coughs> both before and after the peace agreements were signed, seeing tens of thousands of Israelis, not from the left, but from very much all walks of life, interacting with Arabs in a normal environment, and even more so in Morocco, where there's a history of Jewish presence that dates back hundreds of years that doesn't exist in the Gulf. I think that in the long run, these types of interactions that the peace accords have, have given us will help the Palestinian cause, even if we don't see it right now. Um, they also have a restraining uh, tool, uh, force over the current government and preventing a, a, a radical right-wing government from taking steps that are too extreme because the prime minister is very concerned about Israel's image, not just in the world, but also regionally and fighting uh, certain regional battles and trying to normalize with more Arab countries, primarily Saudi Arabia is one that the prime minister is talking about. And he can't do extreme things not that things can't deteriorate to some extent on the ground, but he can't do crazy extreme things uh, as long as the prospect of normalization with the Arab world is there. Uh, if that prospect is cut off, if that prospect is eliminated, uh, I think Israel's mentality, the mentality of Israelis is just to bunker down, become more, more and more closed off and more defense oriented rather than more open. 
So my view is that more normalization, of course, with guarantees for the Palestinians and trying to incorporate the Palestinians into uh, the framework of negotiations, I think in the long run that can do good to the Palestinians. So I'm aware of our time and that it's come to an end. I want to especially thank our colleagues um, for just a wonderful, enlightening, and really powerful conversation. Uh, in the United States this last week, we observed the birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think people sometimes forget that his full name was the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther right. King, and that the real work of the civil rights movement took place in the basements of churches and synagogues and mosques and community organizing organizations, both in the South and in the North. And I think it's a powerful reminder to us that the work of peace building, the work of pursuing justice has to be front and center, not in the basements of our buildings, but in our sanctuaries and in our pulpits and in our classrooms. And, and we need to remember the words of Dr. King's partner in seeking justice, Rabbi Heschel, when they marched together in Selma saying, that day, my feet were praying. We can't just pray for peace. We need to work for peace. That's so right. thank you all for, for joining us. Thank for you. For those online, if you've enjoyed this call, please know that Religions for Peace USA offers a mostly monthly call on contemporary matters of social and moral interest. Our next call will be on Thursday, February 16th at 2 p.m. from 2 to 3 uh, uh, on Faith Voices, Faith Matters, our work together to abolish nuclear weapons. And we're going to be joined by Sean Meyer, co-founder of Back from the Brink, bringing communities to abolish nuclear weapons. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Religions for Peace America. Thank you, Religions for Peace.